So a subtitle of this lecture, which is, well, the main title is Blind Signatures and Undeniable Signatures, but a subtitle could be um, Why Homomorphisms Are Sometimes Desirable. So in the lectures on RSA, I was highlighting the issues with homomorphic properties and also with Algamal, and that normally you don't want them. But I was always saying like, well, use them if you need them, use them if you have a use case for them, but otherwise stay away from it. And so here are two examples, the bind signatures and undeniable signatures, where we deviate from our normal practices of what we want to do with the signatures. So in the case of blind signatures, we are in a situation where Alice can get signatures from some Sam. So Sam is the signer in this lecture. And Sam should not know what he's signing. Now that sounds a little bit odd. Normally, I mean, when you give a signature on something, you check every letter and make sure that you really agree with it. But the use case for blind signatures is eCash. So Sam in this case is the bank and the eCash is in the form of tokens. So Alice can withdraw a token by saying, hey Sam, please give me a signature on this serial number. And this serial number is something that Alice has chosen herself. It should be random, but she has the power to, to pick this. And if she wants a vanity random number, she can pick her birthday, whatever. It doesn't matter to Sam. So Sam will charge her account and give a signature on this token. Now, the downside is that Sam knows what else's token is, and so he can see her payment with this token and who then gets that coin and use it somewhere else and use it somewhere else. So we can trace Alice's payment, and if this is a transferable token, the bank can just chase this. Now, I mean, if you're collecting points with something like you have your Albert Hein card or your payback card or whatever credit card, then you are kind of accepting this. But with cash, you don't accept this. And there are several of us who don't want to be traced by this. And so um, having electronic cash have this annoying feature is just a no-go. So Xiaomi, pretty early on, or in 1983, came up with a solution to this problem. Namely, well, same protocol, but Sam doesn't actually need to know what the serial number is. He just needs to know, yep, it's Alice and she has money on her account. And so, yes, that's a situation where Sam will be willing to sign some serial number. Um, this is an assumption where each token has the same value, but, well, let's just assume that we have this, and else you can deal with having different uh, signing keys for different denominations of the currency. So here you actually want that the signature is homomorphic. So for RSA, for instance, you have your secret key, um, n comma d into public key n comma e. So the signature, now leaving out the hash function. This is where I say, well, this is really dangerous because you have a homomorphic property there, but here we just want this. So what Alice is doing is basically doing the attack that we outlined back then, but now as a constructive feature. So it's called a blinding factor. So she picks some random number, well, co-prime with n, but if she would find anything that's not co-prime with n, she could break um, RSA anyway. And then she asks a signature um, on the blinded message. So M would be the serial number and she wants to get M to the N, M to the D in the end because that's a signature. But she then puts an extra factor of R and not just R but R to the E in front. Because when Bob signs this M prime then he gets the R to the E to the power of D. Well that's just the normal RSA equation so R to the E times D is nothing but R. And Alice had put in R, so she knows it, and she can then remove it. So she gets a valid signature on the M that she's chosen by taking this blinded signature as prime, dividing by R, and then getting this S. So that is just blind signatures in three lines. This is the nicest example that I'm aware of. And yeah, it uh, works. And, well, if you have a use case like eCash, then it's totally worthwhile to use homomorphic signatures. But if you want a normal signature scheme, stay away from it. And then as a second example, um, there are undeniable signatures. So this is unusual for signatures. Normally, well, if Alice signs something, then everybody can verify and she can't deny it. So in that sense, every signature is deniable. 
But let's assume there is a situation where Bob gets a signed message, but he needs to interact with Alice to verify it. So it is somewhat more limited. He cannot go to anyone and say, hey, look, Alice signed this for me. Alice has a bit more privacy. So she can limit who gets to verify because she has to be willing to interact with this party. Also benefit, she can prove that she did not sign something. So if Bob goes to a judge saying, hey, uh, look, Alice signed this, she can also show that it wasn't her. Now, <laughs> why would Bob accept this? Same judge could rule that if she refuses to cooperate, then she, uh, she would be considered a signer. So you can use such signatures and there might be use cases for it. Now, in any case, uh, it's an interesting thing. Can we construct something for it? And what I'm going to show you is a construction from Chaum from 1990 that achieves this. And this one is in the uh, discrete logarithm setting. So we have some group generated by some lowercase g. And we also require a hash function that maps into this g. Now that's nothing specific. We've had this in other cases. And for instance, we have, say, a finite field or we have a subgroup of the finite field. It's pretty easy to find such a hash function. And then we have a normal disc, uh, development or discrete log key pair. And the signature, now that's a bit unusual. So the signature on the message is you take the hash. So in this case, we can actually afford to have a hash around. So certain issues about homomorphism go away. But it's just the hash of the message to Alice's secret power. A. But how can Bob verify this? He doesn't know A. I mean, well, he knows G to the A as something like A. So the verification, as I said above, verification here is interactive. So Bob picks two integers from the, from the range of the exponents and then takes, well, the signature, which should be some eighth power, and Alice's key, which, well, he knows to be an eighth power. So what he knows about Alice is that she's the party that belongs to G to the A. And so he's taking the signature, which should be coming from Alice to the E, this public key from Alice to the F. And so both of those are eighth powers. And then there's some E and F next to it. What Alice does is she computes that thing to the A minus one. So A inverse computed in the exponent group, so computed modulo the order of G. And since both of those were eighth powers, this will remove the power A. And so, well, what is left? So the F was H to the M to the A. Now the A is removed. So what's left is the E and the G to the F. That has a G to the A to the F times A inverse. That should be the. So let's go through this in more detail. So the valid transcript is accepted. So this V, the way that Alice computed it is, is the C to the A inverse. Here is now the expression for that C. Now we're expanding what S was. So S was H of M to the A. Well, this is E in addition. And then there's the Alice's public key, which is G to the A. There's an extra F. And then both of those have this factor A, which gets multiplied by the A inverse. And so what is left is exactly what Bob can, can check. And that's also from this verification, verification equation, um, we can see that this is what we call a zero knowledge protocol. So Bob does not learn anything else about A. Bob doesn't get any information from Alice other than, yes, she actually signed this message. So he could have computed V himself. Well, he even computes V himself and he verifies it. And so he doesn't learn any other information on A. To see an example, so let's take a subgroup of the integers module 23. Um, I'm picking the generator as 2, and so that is group order 11, which is nicely primed, so I can always invert numbers. So my exponents are now between 1 and 10, and I'm picking 9. So then I'm computing 2 to the 9 as my public key. That gives 6. I would also need 9 inverse module 11, so let's pre-compute that as well. So that's 5. And now if I'm signing the message where the hash is 15, I double check 15 is actually in the subgroup generated by 2, test order 11. Then here you go. So the signature is 15 to the 9, and that's 40. And now Bob is challenging me picking 2 and 3. So he computes the signature, 14 squared, 
times my public key, which was 6 up there, to the 3, and that gives 16. Now I'm supposed to compute 16 to the 9 inverse, so 16 to the 5, and that gives 6. That is a coincidence that that matches my public key. Well, the coincidence is that there are only 11 numbers, and I certainly don't want to get one here, so there are only 10 possible numbers, and okay, so I can open it. Now Bob will do the same computation, will do a computation of the same value with a different way, so he takes the hash of the message, which was 14, uh, sorry, which was 15, computes that to his e, then times the generator, which is 2 to the 3, and that also gives 6. So that matches the 6, and so he says, yep, it worked. So I did properly sign the message. Now I promised you that I can also prove that I didn't sign a message. Well, Bob doesn't even tell me which message I'm supposed purported to have signed. He just sends me, hey Alice, here is a signature sent me, or here's a challenge on the signature, give me that one to the A inverse. All right, here we go. So I do that and it doesn't work. Now, if Bob wants to make sure that I'm honest, that I'm actually using the correct A, then what he knows about this A, so the other part here is just the same protocol as before, um, now I'm after the itemized, um, if you want to make sure that I'm really Alice, so I know A, and I'm using the correct A once, uh, A inverse, so I'm not just trying to, to avoid responsibility here. So then he's doing another round. So he now picks R and S. And let's see what he, he gets. So the challenges are now involving R and S. And I'm both times correctly using my A inverse. Now the S doesn't include an A, it's not signed by me, but still all the other steps are matching. So V1 is equal to this S to the E times A inverse. And it was me, so it, the public key with the A matches the A inverse. So that's a g to the f, and in the second case, well, the same with r and s. Now let's see how we can check consistency. Now both of these things on the right have an a inverse. So if now Bob wants to make sure that I'm using the same a inverse on both cases, then let's see. So he can move the g to the f over to the v1, he can move the g to the s over to the v2, and then, okay, he's uh, E in the place of R. So if you multiply the first one, as well, raise the first one to the R and the second one to the E, then we both times have S to the E R A inverse. And that's exactly what he's computing. So he's checking um, if he takes the first one, arranges like I just said, and then raises to the R power, um, transform, move things out of the way, so the G to the S cancel then it's just s to the e a inverse r and while the e and the r can switch positions and then he gets an expression in v2 that he can compute so he accepts this vowel so that means he accepts that alice did not sign if these values are matching so that is um, the way out for alice to prove that she um, didn't produce a signature and um, in other cases well if she does use the A before, then she cannot complete this in a way. So if she's using a different exponent, then the second protocol wouldn't work because the A, well, the A prime that she would be using is not canceling the exponent on the H sub A. So she would leak that it was invalid or that she's trying to uh, sneak out.